quale partiamo. So good morning to everybody. Uh, I will recall that my name is Luigi Bruzzi. Many people in the audience, they know me since many years. We have uh, the pleasure and the honor to have new, new members, new entries that are increasing the, what we call in Italian pink quota because we have many ladies coming from different places. And I'm very pleased you know, to, to open this conference which will be devoted to the analysis of new indicators, especially beyond the GPD. And uh, we have uh, the complete day at our disposition to, <coughs> to have many, many, many speeches on this uh, subject. And uh, I am very pleased to, to welcome everybody and especially the, to our first speaker, Maria Betti, coming from the European Commission, the Joint Research Center in Ispra. She is uh, responsible of a big group uh, working on two main uh, subjects, the environment and the uh, sustainability. So le let me introduce Maria Betti, that uh, after this opening will uh, be our chairperson. Yes, 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 you're right, you're right. So Maria is, is telling me that I had to introduce before the council of the province of, of Ravenna. Uh, says, you're right, you're right. This is the problem. I spent too many years to, to study, but not to respect the formal aspect. <laughs> but I, I hope you will appreciate it anyway. So, uh, uh, okay. So, so we are a big quota. So. Okay, very good. Uh, let me introduce uh, the on sailor to, in the environment of the province of Ravenna, Mara Rancuzzi. Eh? Uh, she, will, uh, she will give us uh, the, the greetings, for the, the welcome from the administration, and she will deliver a short uh, uh, speech for us. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to be here with you because uh, I think that uh, today's conference is uh, it's a really important topic uh, for politics. When I read the first lines of preliminary program, I thought that uh, it is only a, te a technical conference. But the title of the conference seems to say the contrary. In fact, when I read the whole program, I thought that the question, what is a better word, it uh, should be one of the most important questions for a politician. My memory immediately went to the Robert Kennedy's speech in 1968 in the University of Kansas. I'm sure to not be so original, and you certainly know these words, but I would like to remember them with you. In 1968, Kennedy said, but even if we act to erase material poverty, this another greater uh, task it is to confront to the poverty of, of satisfaction, purpose, and dignity that afflict us all. Too much and uh, for too long, we seemed to have surrounded personal excellence and community values in the mere accumulation of material things. Our gross national product now is over $800 billion a year. But that gross national product, if we judge the United States of America by that, that gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage. It counts special locks for our doors and the jails for the people who break them. It counts the destruction of the redwood and the loss of our natural wonder in chaotic sprawl. 
it counts, it counts napalm and counts no, uh, nuclear warheads and armored cars for the police to fight the riots in our cities. It counts Whitman's rifle and Speck's knife and the television programs which glorify violence in order to sell toys to our children. Yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. And uh, it can tell us everything about America, except why we are proud that we are Americans. Kennedy pronounced these words 40, 45 years ago, but uh, this speech could have been written 45 days ago. In 45 years, we haven't found a unit of measure different from GDF yet. Today, when we talk about wellness, happiness, or serenity, we often talk about money. The economic crisis makes it more difficult to not, to not mention money because uh, more and more people are getting into economic troubles. But the economic crisis must be the opportunity to think uh, to a new development model, the sustainable one. This concept includes uh, all kinds of sustainability, environmental, economical, and social. It does not exist a sustainable development without the contemporary presence of these three conditions because the exclusion of one of them undermines the balances, the balances of the world. We could translate this principle into a graph with three colored circles that intersect with each other. But if we want to convert them into facts, we need some quantifiable measures. A unit of measure that a country can use to compare itself with all the others in order to let politicians achieve better results according to a global measurement system. So I thank you and I'm now honored that this international meeting has been organized here in Ravenna. I hope you could answer to the necessity to have indices able to measure a number of conditions such as human cells, clean environment, stable soci uh, social life, etc. Because I really think that it is the only way to give our children a world better than the one we have received. Thank you very much and have a good meeting. Thank you very much for your introduction, very interesting. Uh, in my slides I'm mentioning this speech which is very, very, no, very well known and uh, a, li a little bit prophetic also, because uh, th this statement means that uh, to have uh, happiness for the citizens of a human community, you need not only the GDP, so yeah, let's say in other words, money, but you have to satisfy another lot of conditions that include social stability, human health, possibility to participate in the democratic process. These are all points that were not considered. So it is, it is not enough to have a good environment to be in the right position with the environment. In other words, for example, the cleanliness of water, of air, of uh, the, 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 to respect the principle of biodiversity. But you need also to take into account the, the principal components of uh, of the human life, human life. This is something new, it is the subject of our meeting and, and then we will try to put into evidence the importance of these new parameters to measure, to measure you know, the, the, the economic and social stability of a human community. So I think now, because I am just taking a look of the program, we have now, uh, the takeover of uh, the chairperson is Maria Betti. Let me introduce Maria Betti with a short uh, note on the curriculum. 
So Maria Betti obtained a PhD in chemistry at the University of Pisa, where she still gives lecture as professor of instrumental analytical chemistry of environmental research. She has published more than 200 scientific articles related to environmental uh, chemistry and protection. She has worked in several laboratories in Europe and the United States. From 1990 to 2008, she led the analytical and environment section of the Institute from Transuranium Element. And this is, was the place where I met more than 10 years ago, Maria. And we, we stay in touch since then many, many times. So you are very, very welcome. I am very happy that you are here. And uh, then um, she was in Germany, so which is part of the European Commission Joint Research Center. Now it's going back to the Joint Research Center, but in Ispra. But in the meantime, she had the activity as a director responsible of uh, a unit located in Monte Carlo, Monaco Monte Carlo, for the entire environment program of the IAEA, the, the, the Atomic Energy Agency. And she headed a new division of the agency, Environmental Terrestrial Laboratory of Cyberdots in Austria. And since the 1st of October 2012, she is director of the Joint Research Center Institute for environment and sustainability in uh, ISPRA. So, Maria, again, very, th very, very th many thanks for having come here. And uh, you will start with your uh, speech, and after that you will chair the meeting. So, thank you very much. Uh, Luigi or Professor Bruzzi and thank you very much for all those organized this uh, uh, event today here in Ravenna. I'm very pleased to come back to Ravenna after 10 years I think. I was here already for opening uh, uh, one school. I remember on that uh, uh, was on coastal environment and protection and uh, I have also some remembrance of uh, colleagues who are here today, and I had also the pleasure to have uh, some of your students in my laboratory in Kazra that was very pleased of this. A very good relation also with uh, uh, the University of Bologna, where you were uh, located before. Uh, I would like also to thank the Councillor of the province of Ravenna, because gave me the opportunity to start uh, my speech today. And uh, I will say what we have said, uh, Mrs. Ronguzzi, is uh, um, related very much to the strategy of the European Union for the growth uh, and greening of, uh, of uh, Europe uh, in the next years. And uh, I'm referring mostly to the strategy 2020 of the Union and the Horizon 2020 that will be the next framework program of the Union that will be launched uh, uh, in these days, I think. And if I, I look at the societal so challenges, it's clear that uh, one of the major problems that you have nowadays in Europe and are looking at the program is the sustainability. And this is not a problem of Europe only, but this is a global program, problem. And in fact, uh, the Union is working at the global uh, dimension also. I have decided to uh, focus my speech today on the air quality priorities in Europe for several reasons. One is this, this year is the year of the air quality and uh, there have been uh, several uh, events, even the Green Week organized in May by our Commissioner for Climate Action and Environment, also the two commissioners together, and, uh, and also the Commissioner Potonski. I also received uh, this week the UN Award for the uh, Protection of the Environment. 
And this is very important because after the Nobel Prize for the peace that the Union got, now we have also a commissioner for the environment that has been awarded by the United Nations for the protection that uh, uh, Europe, of the policy in Europe, led by him for the environment, is going in the greening and protection of the environment. The uh, air uh, atmosphere is very important because if we look globally at what are the influences of the air pollution. We are going to touch the urban sustainable living, that is the fast, because our population is mostly now located in cities, and we need to go through towards a sustainable cities, something that in many cases we don't have. So we have to touch green transportation. We have to convince the citizen that uh, uh, they should be responsible more for the uh, condition of their cities and so to use more green um, vehicles. And that our heritage that in Italy is very much touched by pollution, atmospheric pollution, uh, climate change, that is also important, but I wouldn't like to forget the agriculture and the land resource use, because agriculture is using uh, fertilizer, and then we have emission of uh, nitrate, and then this is going in the uh, taken out by in the atmosphere, and then it's related to climate change. So we have uh, several uh, aspects that uh, are all connected, and uh, the um, atmosphere is one of the uh, uh, core part of the transport of pollutants and so consequences how several processes can be um, transported around the world. Then, the report of the WHO has recently declared that uh, air pollution is one of the major risks for the human health. That we are going to touch another part of our uh, GDP, I would say, because if you go in human health, uh, we have to spend more money in order to care the people and the populations. In addition, uh, we have uh, all the cost for the, as I said before, for the infrastructure. Uh, what the Commission is, uh, is doing in this um, is making many efforts with several directives that I will, annoy, I will not annoy you to mention all these, but the results that we had is, not, is that uh, the targets that we wanted to achieve has been achieved. In fact, many member states asked to be prolonged in the um, target that has been fixed, and, uh, uh, and then a revision of the directive for the air quality is really ongoing during this year, and uh, our uh, communication to member state will be, uh, states will be published in, the, in this fall. We are also waiting for the report of the IPCC that, uh, I don't know if it's been launched uh, yesterday, it's been launched because it uh, was still, and uh, this is the working group uh, one, and then we'll have the, the other working group in the, in the next year, and this will be also very much related to the uh, air pollution in correlation to climate change. So we have, uh, as you can see, a really a kind of intersection of all these activity, and uh, I, I really believe that the uh, quality of air is one of the priorities because it's, it's in the middle of all this activity. And I'm looking at you, Alice, that you are an oceanographer and you know that the aerosols, I was also before, now a bit, a bit more uh, in the uh, global environment, but the aerosols that we generate and are absorbed by the surface of the, water, of the oceans, for instance, can provocate very uh, drastic consequences on the biodiversity diversity in the marine environment. That is another, another issue that uh, should be tackled. 
than the um, if uh, if I look at the uh, still the, the which are the, these conferences indicators, but uh, um, I I will leave to the following uh, speakers to speak really about indicators because uh, uh, what the union is doing with Eurostat is uh, to work on statistics that are based on the uh, input of the member states. In my institute, we produce indicators, we work with indicators, and uh, for the um, air quality, for instance, uh, we look uh, the, at the pollution of organic pollutants but mostly to the uh, so-called particulate matters because this is one uh, the presence of the particulate matters is one of the indicator of the um, how much uh, risky is uh, the atmosphere that we have in the cities because the particulate matter is absorbed in the respiratory virus and provocate, can provocate several diseases and uh, another indicator uh, for their pollution is related to the land use resources and in particular I'm referring to sustainable agriculture and the emission of the um, NO2 in the environment due to the use of the fertilizer. Done. Um, we have uh, in my institute uh, one unit dedicated to air quality and climate. That means that the, at the technical level we support the commission um, decision in terms of uh, um, environment protection and not monitoring because monitoring is uh, uh, in the in responsibility of member states and the climate. We have uh, observatory, ECOS observatory in ISPRA sites and also in the natural park of San Rosore on the Tyrrhenian. And this is a historical one because it was initiated for studying the marine aerosols and is continuing to study marine aerosols effect on environment. Then, Another important uh, um, effect uh, of the air pollution is on the forest environment. And forest nowadays is uh, considered very highly because of the biomass that uh, we can obtain from the forest and, uh, and all the evolution of bioeconomy that is related to the green growth. Moreover, the forests are also related to the um, desertification and also to the uh, climate change because deforestation is provocating a kind of uh, um, soil, soil erosion even more uh, intense than before and with the climate, the climate event that we have nowadays in Europe, I mean uh, uh, the inundation of the floods, very strong floods as we had in this uh, summer, uh, before summer in the middle, in the central Europe, this is, uh, uh, can be in, to some extent uh, mitigated by the reforestation. What we have done, we have deforested, and now we should uh, reforest it. And, uh, but uh, the air pollution can provocate disease for forest and for plants. And, uh, and so we still have another argument for which we should think that air pollution should be one of the air quality, more correctly say, is one of our priority if we want to go towards a sustainable development uh, for the environment. Important is also the modeling, uh, the, the modeling activity because we can have short uh, forecast, long forecast, and we can see how uh, uh, much air pollution can be linked to the climate. Uh, change. One of the gaps that we have nowadays for our uh, long uh, uh, prevision on the effect of climate change is the relation between the effect of that the agriculture or the land use resources can have on climate because in agriculture we do only short provision for the uh, crops growth 
and but not long uh, um, forecasting related to the, those that could be meteorological effects. So one of the gap is to uh, link the um, meteorological effects to the uh, agriculture uh, use. And um, uh, yes, and then uh, um, I would like to close here my speech, and I hope to have provoked a bit of discussion in the in this room, uh, and I hope that uh, I have tried. I, 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 at least I have tried to, to uh, show you how much uh, we should concern about the quality of the atmosphere that we breathe in our cities and uh, in our environment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria, for this very nice picture about the situation and the, the efforts made by the European Commission on the problem of air air quality. So I think that this uh, opening lecture we will start. Uh, now I think for the, uh, the questions we do everything at the end of the session. Yeah, I and, think that uh, it uh, is, is better. better. Uh, it's better. So you please uh, keep your uh, question for later on. Okay. So, so now we are we are starting the the morning session, and uh, I am uh, asking Maria to chair this session, to be particularly strict for times, not, not uh, let the speeches go yeah. too, too far, because we, we would like to spare some time just for questions after, okay. Okay, thank so, you very much. And uh, I'm very pleased to chair these sections because the first speaker that I'm going to introduce is really Professor Luigi Bruzzi. And Professor Bruzzi um, started uh, his career in um, Bologna after the graduation in the same university. And uh, he was mostly uh, at activity at the CNEN at that time, that was a nuclear institution in Italy that became after INEA with uh, uh, acronym, in the acronym of INEA at that time there was nuclear inside, today there is no more nuclear, but still INEA is, and this was for a period of 62-85. And then from 1795, he was lecturing on nuclear energy at the Faculty of Engineering at the University of Bologna as associate professors. From the 94 to the 26, 26 he has been lecturing at the Faculty of Science as associate, associate professor of environmental science, and uh, now he's lecturing in Italy and abroad. And uh, I know that uh, he's he, during his long career he spent a lot of time studies and research on energy and environment. He's author of many publications. I think uh, many of us in this room knows his publication and also books and uh, is very good speakers and you can invite him for giving lecture on each subject on science and you'll be very much satisfied. And today I will ask Professor Bruzzi to speak about the new indicator for a better environment and life and uh, I will ask him to be restricted yes. to the I 20 minutes yes. and uh, yes. I, will not, I will not have respect yes, maybe, of you and I will stop you. Maybe two you minutes before you... Yes, okay. I will make you... Okay. I need my, my, my PPT slides. I don't know. Maybe huh? I, can, I can try to help you. Uh, where is the technique? Uh, Andrea, ci vuole la mia, la mia presentazione. Ah, the bottom. Ah, this one. Ah, okay. So, Luigi Bruzzi, yes, yes. Okay, very good. I can start Oh, yes, here. Okay, all right. So, this is a, a very introducing uh, speech about. Uh, <coughs> 
about the indicators that are now are now studied to, to, to give uh, a more uh, complete uh, uh, information <coughs> for human communities, not only for environment. So it's something, it's something new. So all the policies in environmental feed require that the number of characteristics defining the status of ecosystem are continuously measured. So there is a continuous monitoring for uh, uh, many of these indicators we will mention and that we will uh, be treated during the meeting. The monitoring of environmental and biological variables measuring the status of environment has been carried out for many years. We are all aware about of this uh, activity. The main objective is monitoring, is to detect uh, the trends and to describe their evolution. So it was very, already mentioned by Maria and also by the Council, Mara Marcuzzi, that we, we need to know the status of environment. And so we use this kind of activity to keep under control uh, the evolution. So you, you, you can realize uh, after this monitoring that uh, the situation is going worse or we, is going better. And this is uh, important to have the uh, the most uh, adequate behavior to control the, the situation of the environment. Do we have really indicator measuring the level of, of the investigated system? So we have already heard about uh, the previous uh, speeches that uh, we need to, to keep under control the situation of air, air quality, but similar uh, attention is devoted to water systems or to ent an entire territory. Uh, I would like to, to mention one thing that will be delivered in a, in a speech uh, in this morning. We are trying to, to do this kind of uh, experiment, uh, experimental activity with a little state of San Marino. We are trying to take uh, uh, all the data regarding the, the quality, since it is a, a, a reality very, very little, only, only 30,000 people and a very, very, little, uh, very little surface, but could be an example for, for example, public administration. So in this case, you need an observatory. In this observatory, you keep, you keep under control all, you know, the data, uh, needed not only to give uh, an opinion about the quality of the status, but also uh, in your observatory, the, the concept is that you are following uh, the historical data before and the data later on. And so this is an exercise we are trying, trying also with uh, uh, doctor thesis, for example, that they are looking for this. But uh, we have to realize that the economic and social conditions are very important to, for the welfare of the human community. So in other words, it is not uh, enough you know, to take into account uh, the GDP but because it gives only partial economic information. And it is disregarding data related to human health, environment, and social aspects. It will uh, remain, as we will uh, see later on, the GPD is important. Without money, it is impossible to do, to do anything. So we need to have uh, something uh, related to the economical health. But uh, the idea that poorly economic measures, such as gross domestic product, do not show whether people are feeling happy and living well has been around for than a decade. It was already mentioned, the speech of Robert Kennedy. Uh, I know very well the, the speech because uh, I remember that at that time I was in the United States in the same, in the same year, in the 68, when uh, Robert Kennedy was killed. I was in Los Angeles. And the day before I had seen Robert Kennedy doing the uh, I do say the, 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 the advertising for to be elected. So this is in my memory. 
But uh, we can say that uh, uh, these new uh, social indicators were studied uh, uh, about uh, 30 years ago, 20 to 30 years ago, by the United Nations, one, one of the group of the United Nations. They, they introduced the Human Development <coughs> Index. The Human Development in in Index is something that takes into account uh, three requirements. One is good health, little amount of money, of course, and also e education. So in other words, uh, they were asking how you can make happy a citizen, giving to him a good health, some money, and especially education. If you have education, you can, you know, you, you, you can have you know, the chance to appreciate architecture, poetry, and so on. If you think only about economics, you can disregard many other things. So this was the principle followed by the United Nations for introducing this index. Okay, this is something we have already mentioned. In recent years, the development of indicators able to measure the level of well-being has proceeded and important studies have been conducted, especially in Europe. I would like to mention, and if we have no time to, to go into, into the problem uh, more deep, uh, I, I would like to mention now that uh, uh, the first studies were made by the United Nations with this human, uh, human Development Index. But in the, in the last decade, uh, there were um, other studies made, especially from OECD in Paris, OECD, and uh, uh, there was a, a special engagement of uh, Enrico Giovannini, who is now the Ministry of uh, uh, Work and uh, what else? I don't remember. Politicians. Welfare. No, no, no welfare. No welfare. But it was also director of ISTAT, the Institute for Statistical Data of Italy. <laughs> and uh, together with the commission instituted by uh, Nicolas Carpo, uh, Sarkozy, uh, President of France, it was created a commission in uh, 2008, specially devoted to introduce new indicators to uh, cover all the, you know, the needs uh, you have, uh, not only for environment, but for all other, other aspects we mentioned before. So during this conference, we, we will have uh, uh, speeches, we, we heard uh, already a speech about uh, air quality. We will have similar, similar approaches for other components. Uh, and uh, we uh, will introduce uh, also the, the main results of these new studies, like uh, the, what I mentioned before, OECD, uh, the ISTA together with the CNEL, also CNEL, Economia and, and Lavoro, uh, made in Italy, who is now is now a reference point very important. Every, every day our environment is facing different conditions. So environment is a system that is changing very quickly and continuously in time. And the size of this effect depends on the nature and intensity of parameters to whom the system undergoes. In many cases, we need to keep the system under control in order to follow its evolution in time and space. The requested response is the attempt to address the system toward better condition by using suitable parameters, indicators, able to measure the quality of the investigated system. So there is also in this concept uh, the, the willingness to, to evaluate what are, for example, the fragility of a system and to give priority of intervention for special and peculiar aspect of the system you are, uh, you are analyzing. Indicators able to characterize a system are manifold, including not only environmental parameters, but also economic and social variables, such as income, health, well-being, happiness, social status, and so on. 
So this is a very well-known system. This is a, for, uh, for measuring the air quality and especially maybe also the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. But this is, is as an example that we are equipped everywhere of uh, tools able to measure the quality of different components. See, this is a mention, something mentioning something is happening in our country, in Taranto. Uh, it is a very, very bad situation because there is a contrast be between uh, the possibility to, to give job to many people at the same time to protect the environment. So, in Taranto, there was, there was even no ideas about how to detect the evolution. And everything was, was left to maybe to the goodwill of few people, but not political intervention. And now this is a debate we have at the political level in Italy, not yet solved. Even a few days, few days ago, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, shown by television that uh, uh, the government is discussing at the high level how to, how to face these terrible problems. But this is a case in which we, we didn't have, uh, you know, attention. And uh, this is a very well known, so how you detect uh, the, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. In many, many places, uh, I think also in Monte Simone we have a, a station of this kind. But this is Ma, Moana Loa record, uh, in, uh, is a, a spent volcano in, uh, in California, I think, something like that. Okay, uh, uh, let's, let's go ahead because, uh, so what is an indicator so you, you can take a look? Uh, the criteria for choosing good indicator is based on quality characteristics such as validity, reliability, sensibility to the phenomenon studied. So in other words, you, 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 you will start to do some kind of investigation, you have to know uh, in advance what are the critical parameters for this kind of system. And for, for uh, every type of system you have different approach uh, which is connected to this, uh, to this, uh, to this uh, study. Sustainability indicators intend to offer information to local citizens and local authorities which are committed to achieve a sustainable model of development. So this is, means that when you approach the problem of indicators, it's not enough to, to, to verify that these data are acceptable, but should be also the starting point for political actions. For political. The sustainability indicators go beyond the functions typically performed by environmental parameters, by, in, by taking into account also economic and social dimension. This is something that we... Okay, we'll skip this. Quattro minuti non sono pochi. Okay, so the, this was mentioning this, I don't, I don't know in, in depth of this concept, but there are, there are examples of observatory uh, that will be described later on. One is, is, was in France because it was closed for no, not having enough money in France. No, in France, in Spain, excuse me. And uh, Pedro, our speaker, will talk about this. And uh, we will also present uh, our small study about, uh, about San Marino. So these are figures for GPD, just to, to see how Italy is located. And this is very interesting, just to, to see. You can see, for example, two, two states, one is Singapore and the other is Italy. They have uh, the same HDI, but they have different uh, GPD per capita. This means that uh, the, the GPD is not significant. It doesn't take into account the other two requirements, health and uh, in, uh, instruction uh, education, but only economy. And we will see, we will see this. Uh, 
Uh, this is a typical, uh, a typical indicator for energy. So this means that uh, if you want to be good uh, by using your energy, you have to calculate this indicator, which is the energy intensity. So it's the amount of energy you have put into a process, into a country, to get the maximum, uh, the minimum amount of, uh, of money. So it's the, it's the amount uh, of uh, richness you are able to produce with spending uh, energy. Just to see uh, how is this, for example, you see that uh, Canada or the United States or some other countries, they have uh, uh, energy intensity very higher than European countries, this is Italy. But you see that there is a trend toward more, less, uh, less values uh, uh, in big countries, but uh, the difference between remains very high. You know, this means that those, those states uh, are using heavy technologies where you need a lot amount, a, a big amount of money to produce a unit of richness, which is the GPD. Un minuto. Un minuto. So, I skip the, the speech of Robert Kennedy because it no, was already uh, done. I think uh, that uh, <laughs> you have been anticipated. No? Okay, let, let me just uh, show uh, the result of uh, a Canadian study. Ecco, Canadian study to evaluate the well-being index, they need, you see, these domains, they call domains, they are eight domains for which annual they have eight indicators. So you collect all these data, you put, you, you put them into this, uh, this circle, and then you go to the, to the big, uh, uh, let's say, collector, and you get the Canadian Index for our Wellbeing. So this would be, the Canadian, they have studied this uh, uh, this uh, index uh, for uh, about uh, 17 years. So they have a good statistic already. And the result is this, and uh, this is my last, uh, my last slide. You see that the ZPD uh, during the, uh, the time between 1994, uh, 1994 to 2010, the GPD, which is uh, uh, the, the amount uh, of riches produced, uh, increased by almost 30 percent, 28.9. But at the same time, if you go to see the Canadian index of well-being, the increase was only 5.10. This means that if you want to make your citizen happy, uh, you, you need to, to take into account, especially other aspects. You see, the two after that is disregarded very much are culture, which is very important for our country, and environment. They are already, uh, no, they have, uh, uh, let's say, an evolution, negative evolution, that uh, gives, uh, as a result, that the, the index is growing only 5.7. So this is just a very short picture, but behind this picture there is a lot of scientific work done, and we are trying to use these approaches to evaluate these small states of 30,000 people, mm -hmm. very similar as the number of population of many municipalities, eh? or province also. Could be, could be interesting to investigate also a system of this kind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luigi, for this uh, interesting presentation on the indicators and the example of Canadian. I would like now to give the floor to Cristina Sabbioni, who is the director of the Institute of Atmospheric Science and Climate of the Italian National Research Council. And her main scientific interest is focused on the damage of cultural heritage due to atmospheric uh, interaction. Christina has been project leader in the national CNR projects and European projects on damage to cultural heritage since 1984. And she has been the chairperson of the expert advisory group of the key action, the city of tomorrow and cultural heritage. 
within uh, the fifth European Framework Program on Research. She has also coordinated the CNOAA ARC project, that is the Global Climate Change Impact on Built Heritage and Cultural Landscape, which in uh, 29, the Grand Prix of Europe Nostra. She is Professor of Environmental Physics at the University of Bologna, and she is the Italian member of the Executive Board of the Joint Programming Initiative, Cultural Heritage and Global Change, a new challenge for Europe that is coordinated by Italy. And uh, to remain in team, uh, Christina is speaking today about the indicators for air pollution and climate change and the impact on cultural heritage. Please. Thank you, uh, Professor Brutti, for inviting me at this uh, very interesting uh, uh, international conference on new indicators for a better world. And thanks to the chair for this very nice presentation. I'm going to summarize the results we have achieved in our institute on the impact of air pollution and climate change on cultural heritage. In very few cases, I will be able to give you indicators, but when possible, I will mention it. Well, the environment is interacting with uh, cultural heritage through its uh, climate and pollution parameter, and the materials characterizing cultural heritage are the most diverse, from uh, uh, stone, wood, metals, glass. Uh, this interaction produces a number of different processes. I'm going to speak about a few of them, including the formation of damage layer on monument, the chemical dissolution which produces surface recession, soil crystallization which produces the cohesion. And then we will see how all these damage processes are linked to the air quality indicator and meteorological and climate indicator. Um, all monument realized with good quality stone, that is low porous stone, marble and limestone, are characterized by black and white pattern. Black area are the area where damage layer are produced and white area where we have leaching. Let's look at these two different process and at what parameter are linked. Well, the formation of damage layer is mostly due to the transformation of calcium carbonate into gypsum, so we have this process of sulfation, but this damage layer are black because of the aerosol embedded in, the, in this damage layer, which are mostly carbonaceous particles. If we analyze this uh, layer on a different number of site monuments in Italy, in Europe, we see that uh, sulfide show very well that uh, sulfation is linked to uh, SO2 dry deposition. What is the scenario in this century of CO2 concentration? You know very well that thanks to the very good policy, Europe was able not only to set up but to implement the air quality in Europe is uh, uh, increasing air quality and the scenario of CO2 show that during this century we will have a decrease. So uh, what we are going to face for our monument is that this sulfation process will decrease. That means that the other effect which imply aerosol deposition or climate change impact will have a more important impact. This is what we expect for this good quality material, marble, um, limestone, the one which characterized the most important monument, not only in Italy, but all over Europe. We have seen that uh, uh, damage layer are black because of carbonaceous particle embedded in it. So it is very important to measure carbon component is this da damage layer. We were able to identify a methodology 
which may discriminate the uh, carbonate carbon which belong from the stone, so it is, it is not anthropogenic, and also elemental carbon and organic carbon within this damage layer. We have applied this methodology in a number of different monuments all over Europe. And what we have found is that in most damage layer in European town, uh, Florence, Rome, Paris, Sevilla, London, we have organic carbon prevailing on elemental carbon. And this is a link which show that uh, the emission for uh, traffic is now prevailing in the formation of this damage layer. It is also very interesting if we compare old crust with modern crust. We have a number of examples in Italy, in Milano, the Dome, in Venice, Cornell Palace, where we know for sure that the age of this uh, uh, damage layer is five, five centuries. And we see that in this case, the ratio between EC and OC is much higher than one, between one and two, so elemental carbon prevail. But if we look at recent crust, and we have example in Rome, for instance, the Vittoriano, here in Ravenna, or Florence, where we have restoration recently, we see that this ratio is completely opposite, organic prevail, and this ratio is always lower than one. So the composition of this damage layer is reflecting how atmosphere, atmosphere composition is changing. And in fact, is for instance, in Florence, we make a survey on the distribution of this damage layer and the composition, for instance, we have a survey in 55, uh, uh, 54-55 last century, then a complete restoration intervention was performed just after, and we repeat this survey nowadays, we see that the distribution <laughs> of this damage layer is different, but above all is different the color. Uh, they are less black and more yellow, and this uh, it reflects the um, different composition of the atmosphere. We have less sulfur, more nitrate, more organic, uh, and this uh, um, composition of black crust encouraged by logical growth. Uh, this is very well reflected if we make optical analysis, and we see that we have an increase in A star and B star index, uh, which measure very well how the color of the composition is changing because it's changing its composition. That make an increase of organic and we require different way of cleaning monument. And also show that 50 years are not sufficient. We have to restore and restore our monument continuously because the blackening due to air particle is going on continuously. So this is what we are experiencing in all Europe. Uh, color is very much linked to, to uh, uh, dirtiness. And uh, we have made a survey um, asking people how they perceive uh, dirtiness on our monument. And we have found uh, an index which link dirtiness to soiling. And what is the acceptable index? Uh, people perceive when they look at blackening. We have linked this uh, uh, index with the concentration we should have in the atmosphere and we have found a threshold which is uh, 2-3 microgram per cubic meter 
which is the value we should keep below in order to limit this uh, blackening in our monument. Uh, I see I have problem in the presentation and uh, so I will tell you what the slide doesn't show here. Uh, we have look not only at uh, um, uh, ancient material but also to uh, modern material uh, including cement and we have seen that uh, uh, modern material like cement uh, have uh, um, damage process which are even higher than uh, uh, ancient material because uh, as to the deposition once gypsum is formed react with the original component of the material and produce the formation of secondary product which are etringite and thaumazite and this secondary damage product produce um, damage which uh, 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 induce blackening, expansion, formation of cracking within uh, the um, material. Uh, now I see that uh, the images uh, are lost uh, and this will be, I think, uh, uh, a pity for what I wanted to show you, which is the impact uh, of climate change on cultural heritage, where uh, what uh, we have to underline is that among all the change uh, which are uh, expected in this century, the most important factor changing is water cycle. All the uh, effect uh, producing damage on monument are linked to water. So the change in water cycle will be one which will mostly affect uh, um, our uh, cultural heritage. So for this reason, we have uh, uh, evaluated the number of cycle around the 70.5% relative humidity, which is the value at which sodium chloride crystallize. And uh, uh, we have evaluated the number of cycle uh, per year, and we see that uh, uh, if we compare uh, what happened in uh, the baseline period to the future, 2070-2099, we have an increase in number of uh, salt crystallization cycle all over Europe. Um, I'm, um, I apologize for not uh, uh, being able to show you the map, um, apparently is a problem of the system. Biomass accumulation is linked to temperature and precipitation and it is also a general increase in Europe. Surface recession is due to um, uh, precipitation, so we may uh, produce a scenario where we linked uh, uh, surface recession to the change in precipitation, in CO2 concentration, and to the composition of precipitation. And then to see how this amount change in the future. In this case, we are able to uh, use damage function and to figure in the future as a function on how precipitation change but also the solubility of calcium carbonate is linked to CO2 and is linked to temperature. So uh, using the output of the global and regional model at a different CO2 concentration by 330 to 750 and to the change in temperature, we are able to evaluate how is the amount of uh, uh, material which is uh, uh, washed out by precipitation in this century. We have also to introduce a correction 
which is linked to uh, the fact that when we have a snow precipitation, there is no leaching. So all the event of precipitation below zero have to not be taken into account. So the scenario will produce only when we have rainfall. I'm going to conclude by that time. Uh, the mapping we have produced show that uh, uh, the absolute value of surface recession is going to increase in Central Europe, UK, Iceland, uh, um, all the um, uh, uh, Iberian Peninsula uh, and North Spain. And these values are going to range between 20 30 micron per year. And if we look at the difference between the baseline period and the far future period, that is 1961-90, uh, 2070-2099, we have an increase of 30% uh, uh, increase. Uh, thermal stress is very important for um, me the Mediterranean ba basin. So all what is caused by thermal um, uh, cycle, the temperature difference by night and day, uh, will have a very big impact on Mediterranean basin on monument uh, which are realizing calcite because of the um, uh, thermal expansion of uh, calcite, which is uh, anisotropic. Uh, so we have uh, uh, indicated guideline for a preventive conservation of monuments located in urban areas. First of all, we have to prioritize climate parameter and pollutant parameter causing uh, deterioration. Now, then we have to define risk, and this risk need a continuous environmental monitoring close to the monument. General air quality network in most of the cases are not suitable for cultural heritage because air quality network were uh, exactly planned for health purpose protection. So in most of the case, we have to provide monitoring precisely dedicated to um, cultural heritage. Then we have to promote action to reduce this factor. And when possible, mitigate the negative cause and that make that we have to um, include in the developing urban plan cultural heritage as an indicator to be protected because cultural heritage, because of all the aspects linked to the quality of life mentioned by Professor Bruzzi, mentioned by the chair, by the introduction, need to put uh, cultural heritage in the center of our indicator. Our town are characterized by cultural heritage, not only in, in Italy, but in Europe. They uh, represent our identity and they need to be preserved as well as health, as well as ecosystem. I thank you very much for your attention as well as all the, my collaborators which produce most of the results I have shown you. I apologize for not being able to show some of the figure, but I hope that uh, the message of the impact of air quality and climate change on cultural heritage was uh, mm, very quickly present to you, but uh, it uh, offered discussion for this uh, very interesting day. Thank you. Thank you.
very much, Christina, for these presentations because you bringing us now in the real uh, pragmatical contest of the previous discussions that were introductory and we can really see into tangible examples so how we should preserve our city and in the urban development, of course, the cultural heritage is one of the most important parameters that uh, we should consider. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now I would like to continue the program of today and uh, I am pleased to give the floor to Professor Abbiati. Uh, Professor Abbiati um, studied biological science at the University in Pisa and he moved later after the PhD uh, that he obtained in Genoa. And then he became Professor of Ecology at the University of Bologna since 22. He's teaching marine and applied ecology, and he has worked in several laboratories in Europe, Australia, and the United States. And in the framework time 2000-2003, he was organ organized and directed the second level master of uh, ICGM. That I don't know what is it, but you can tell me later because it's these acronyms. <laughs> okay, thank you. And from the 2008 and 2012, he led the new master degrees on marine biology. Biology is a member of the board of several scientific society and institutions, and has published more than hundreds. Uh, scientific articles related to impact assessment, conservation and management of marine and coastal habitat, and marine resources. And these studies have been supported by the national international research grants from the Italian ministries, European Commission, and private companies. And this presentation today is changing from atmosphere to marine ecosystem effectively, and they titled Marine Ecosystem Conservation Indicators and Indices, and uh, I'm really very interested in listening to you, and I give you the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much for your presentation, and thank you to Luigi Bruzzi for uh, inviting me to the conference. And uh, I will provide uh, my critical view to the indexes and indicators, since uh, I'm still convinced that uh, uh, indices and indicators of um, environmental quality are essential, but uh, we have always to keep in mind that uh, when you are summarizing complex features in uh, a single number, there are critical aspects that has to be considered. Um, so, okay, so uh, quickly I will uh, uh, remind about the European directives that have been uh, recently uh, implemented and that require the development of indexes. And uh, I will uh, comment briefly on what are the sources of complexity in ecosystem, how the European directives affected the research in uh, the field of biotic indexes, what are the critical aspects of those uh, uh, indexes, and uh, what, in my opinion, are the management perspectives. Uh, the target. Um, both the Water from Directive and the Marine Strategy stressed that we have to define the ecological status, and basically we have to uh, characterize the good ecological status of water ecosystems, coastal, freshwater, um, and uh, marine ecosystems. And this is a very nice sentence, or we would like to have a good quality of environment, but what uh, does good quality of environment mean? It's really not easy to define, it's, it's often a very vague term. Um, and this, uh, because uh, uh, Oops. Uh, yeah, because uh, uh, when you are dealing with living uh, organisms with a very dynamic part of, uh, the, uh, of Earth, uh, we have to deal with a uh, huge sources of complexity. And uh, uh, in the last uh, decades, uh, research also in the marine environment has been focusing more mainly in quantifying uh, variability and sources of variation in uh, marine ecosystems. And uh, um, six major uh, dimensions of complexity have been outlined, which are the spatial complexity, temporal complexity, structural complexity, complexity of processes, 
behavior, which has been uh, largely neglected, and also the uh, physical complexities, geometric complexity. Very briefly, for the people that is not familiar with the marine environment, uh, we're going to speak about spatial complexity. We are just speaking about the variability in the distribution and abundance of species in, in space. So if we look uh, at uh, any landscape or seascape, we see that it's not homogeneous especially the natural landscape or seascape. When uh, human activities come uh, in play, usually we get more, much more homogeneous habitats and much more homogeneous environments, but naturally species are really very heterogeneously distributed. And they are characterized by uh, temporal dynamics, so things change in time. Uh, they change because uh, there is a natural dynamic of ecosystem, they change because the humans are affecting the ecosystems, they change because uh, uh, we are also promoting variability, variation in the distribution of species, like invasions. Uh, I just put here a slide showing that uh, from the Posidonia meadow, which is very typical Mediterranean habitat, we can move to the Caulerpa meadow just because Caulerpa has been introduced by humans to the marine environment. Uh, and so we can uh, face very harsh dynamics. Structural complexity is mainly related to the processes that occur in the marine environment. And uh, I mean, we can consider the food webs, which is the most familiar one, but the competition, facilitation, and many other species interaction obviously add complexity to the structure of ecosystems. Uh, complexity of processes uh, uh, is, has been defined as uh, the complexity related to the um, uh, processes that require many steps and the involvement of several elements, many elements of the ecosystem. But the very typical uh, process is the primary production, which involves uh, of, of the vegetation, but many other aspects related to the primary production, and also the composition, which goes on in a step-by-step -step evolution of the process. Behavior, behavior, as I mentioned, is, has been largely neglected, but uh, behavior change, behavior is uh, natural behavior, behavior is also human-induced. Often, uh, we change the habits and we change the attitude of the species just by our presence in, envir in the environment. And uh, the, oops, the geometric complexity, which is a structural complexity, the habitat complexity. Uh, geometric complexity is also... Uh, has been also recently introduced as a concept. Uh, we are accustomed to speak about the Great Barrier Reef as a huge uh, um, structure built by uh, organisms, but uh, uh, we didn't, I mean, focus on it as a, a uh, like a bio, biogenic uh, structure which add a dimension, a third dimension to what is a natural environment, a flat natural environment. And uh, uh, once we have listed the comp sources of complexity, what uh, do we have to supply to people that is dealing with management and uh, that is making uh, rules uh, about how to deal with the environment? We should supply something that uh, is summarizing all this complexity. And uh, these are supposed to be the indi indicators uh, and uh, ecological indicators or indexes are expected to be able to reflect uh, the complexity of the environment, uh, but also to define the quality of the environment, uh, to allow an easy ranking in terms of good or poor quality of the environment, uh, and they should be also able to detect changes in time uh, following the human intervention. So we can have a negative impact by polluting the environment, but we can also have a positive impact by restoring the environment or improving the environmental quality, try to improve the environmental quality. And uh, uh, historically, we have been always dealing with uh, an attempt to judge the quality of the environment. Uh, in, the, in, the, I mean, in everyday life, everybody is uh, saying this environment is nice and good, uh, another environment is uh, polluted or is not nice and not pleasant. And uh, uh, we started, uh, as humans, uh, judging about the quality of the environment, uh, basically followed the expert judgment. So people, naturalists, uh, were uh, observing the environment, trying to make a strong scientific background in themselves, and following the expertise, uh, they were deciding which environment was good and which wasn't. And this was obviously a very subjective approach, and this approach maybe was uh, still 
paying uh, before the impact of human activities on the environment were so intense as they are now. In the 20th century, uh, we started dealing with the marine environment, uh, trying to quantify the, uh, the uh, features of the environment. Quantitative sampling and uh, analysis of samples and some statistical approaches have been developed about 100 years ago. In the 60s uh, of the last century, we started doing some experiments, trying to figure out which are the causal relationship between the uh, dynamics that we can observe in the marine environment. And finally, in the 90s, uh, we started developing experimental design to test hypotheses about environmental changes. And this is uh, what uh, it was a major step towards uh, an attempt to have an objective evaluation of the environment rather than a personal judgment on the environmental quality. And in the experimental designs that are trying to quantify environmental changes and environmental quality, the three key points are the comparisons with the reference condition, the replication in time, and the replication in space. And these three points are uh, um, included also in the modern uh, indexes that have been developed following the Water from Directive and Marine Strategy. So we see that uh, the basic uh, I mean, uh, reference points are still the same reference condition and replication. And this is needed because uh, we cannot uh, judge about changes in the environment by comparing two points, because the difference between the two points can be just uh, a random difference. We need to have, uh, uh, due to the uh, uh, high level of variability of the environment, we need to have several points in time and several points in space in order to see if what we observe is a real change or is just uh, part of the natural variation of the environment that we are studying. Hmm? And these are methodological constraints that uh, should be kept in mind uh, when we are talking about indexes. And uh, there is no statistical analysis that, that can overcome those issues. Those issues have to be implemented in the data collection, which is a key point for any index we would like to use uh, to assess the environmental quality. At the end, uh, when we sample, we obtain a matrix uh, which can be made up by uh, thousands or tens of thousands of data which are scattered in a large uh, spreadsheet of Excel like in this case and there is a lot of zeros and a lot of numbers showing how abundant the species are and when we are trying to propose an index we usually try to extract for the huge matrix made by I mean, thousands or tens of thousands of cells uh, a single number summarizing all the information this is, again, not a new task. In the past, in the 50s, quite a lot of indexes have been proposed to quantify and to summarize the information contained in the matrices. Those indexes uh, were based on the number of species, abundance of the species, and the distribution of the individuals among the species. But they didn't consider the feature of the single species. So species 1, 2, and 3 were the same as uh, having a name and having a... Uh, ecological features of the single species. The major change that the Water Framework Directive imposed is that the indexes developed under the Water Framework Directive are considering the species as an entity, and so they are based on what are the quality and what are the features of a species. The species is not just a number, the species is something which has an ecology, a life cycle, a life history, and so provides information by itself. Is not uh, is extremely important which are the species occurring in the sample. It doesn't matter only the number of species, but which are exactly the species that occur there. And so, in the, uh, following the Water from Directive, quite a lot of indexes have been developed, and I just made a very, very partial list. You can see that there are uh, indexes with different acronyms that have been developed. Uh, I listed 13 of them, but there are many more in the literature. And another very interesting aspect that I uh, would like to bring to your attention is that uh, following the, water from the publication of the Water from the Directive, the number of publications on indexes rises dramatically in the scientific literature. I just did a very, I mean, it's not, these data are not particularly reliable because I did just a very quick search on Easy Web of Science. But you see that uh, the Water from the Directive was published in the 2000. There is a three years gap before people start publishing the data they collected, and then since the 2005, the number of publications rises up to, I mean, 60 publications per year. And uh, this is, to me, a very interesting example about how politics 
can drive science. I mean, uh, mm, since the paper has been published, a lot of people that was ignoring, totally ignoring the need for an index, uh, started working on index, trying to develop indexes, which is positive and negative at the same time, because what happened at the end uh, is that we have many papers that are dealing with the development of biotech indexes. And so I listed 13 indexes, but um, Diaz et al., they uh, compare in their paper 64 indexes, which are all related to marine environment. So 64 indexes is quite a lot. <coughs> So many papers are developing indexes, many papers are dealing with the application of their own indexes, and very few papers are comparing the results of indexes and validating the indexes, which is, to me, the most important exercise in the end, because we don't need to have 10 or hundreds of indexes, we must have few effective indexes, and we have to check if those indexes are really providing information about the environmental quality, or just providing numbers referring to some specific condition. The background, the background um, for the indexes is uh, basically the dated person Rosenberg model, where it's assumed that uh, along an organic enrichment gradient or along uh, a stress gradient, uh, we move from uh, K strategy species to the R strategy species, and a peak of opportunity, opportunity species appear before the uh, environment gets deformated. And, uh, Following this model, most indexes are based on the classification of species in terms of their sensitivity to disturbance. And I just brought the example from Borgia, which is one of the most popular indexes that is used in the uh, marine environment in Europe. And you can see that there is a group one of species that are very sensitive to disturbance, which means that they are showing good environmental quality if they are there, or poor environmental quality if they are not, species which are indifferent to disturbance, so tolerant species, and uh, species tolerant to organic matter, to enrichment of organic matter. First group of opportunities, opportunistic species that survive in stressed environment, and that sec and this first order of opportunistic species which are extremely tolerant. So this is interesting classification, and uh, uh, is the main point that is uh, distinguishing the indexes that have been developed after the water from directive compared to the indexes before the water from directive, which are not classifying the species, so every species was counting as an entity, no matter what was its relationship with the environment. And uh, how can we allocate species to the different groups? That's, the, to me, the more, one of the major criticisms in the indexes. So we know that, for instance, Capitella capitata is a polychaete worm uh, that lives in marine environment in coastal habitats. It's considered opportunistic and lives, dwells very well in very polluted and organic rich habitat, while Hydrobia ventrosa, a nice snail, is living in uh, more clean and good environmental condition. But are we sure that uh, all individuals and all population of the species reflect the same environmental condition? And how do we demonstrate that indeed Capitella capitata is showing organic enrichment and Hydrobia ventrosa is showing good environmental quality? So how can we allocate species to a certain group? Yeah. Yep. Uh, so very few experimental studies uh, have shown effective relationship between species and environmental quality. So most of those classifications are arbitrary and basically are referring to the uh, experts that are deciding what is the future of the species. And uh, we should be really careful about uh, defining this attribution of species to the different class. The second very critical point is that uh, we see that uh, um, there are I mean, major variations between biogeographic regions and species of assemblage differ between different areas. And therefore, what we notice is that most of the indexes have been developed for the local uh, habitats, and uh, they are working very well in the area where they have been developed, and often they don't work so well when you try to apply them to different areas. And you see that in many of the indexes that I've listed before, there are Catalonia Index, Swan Wetland Index, Chisabri Bay Index, Carolina Bentic Index, uh, Virginian Coast uh, Index, and so on, San Francisco History Index. So there are very local indexes which are not really providing a comparative evaluation of the environment. And if we use different indexes to evaluate the quality of the same environment using the same data set, we see that 
we can get a, quite an heterogeneous picture. We have a very conservative index, Dibentix, that says everything is bad. We have quite an op uh, optimistic index, like Bits, which is, says that is good or highly good and some intermediate. But we also have, uh, I mean, indexes that show intermediate positions. So, comparison between indexes, to me, is one of the most important points. The same happens if we compare uh, data from different lagoons, in this case, uh, along the southeast European coast, and we see that, again, between Ambin Bentix, we don't have strict consistency, but often the results are different. So, uh, it's obvious that we still have to do a lot of work on indexes in order to validate them and to prove that they are effective in assessing environmental quality. Therefore, I think that indexes are really a powerful tool, and, and we must develop indexes, and we might have to work on indexes, but uh, we uh, need to, uh, uh, def to uh, I mean, check carefully what uh, the index is indeed showing, and uh, uh, defining the standard condition where the index should be applied to test if it is consistent with what are the environmental condition is one of the priority. Independent validation of indexes using different data sets from those that have been used to develop an index. So applying indexes to different geographic regions or to different areas is also extremely useful to understand how the index work. Intercalibration of the indexes by comparing results obtained in different regions should provide the information about how the index works worldwide and not just for the place where it has been developed. And uh, reduce to the minimum the expert judgment, which means that the species should be really attributed to a group when we have evidences that they belong to this group, that they show something. Because uh, it's not obvious that species is showing or is indicating some environmental feature. Adapt adaptive strategies are, and species are very flexible, so they may adapt to many, to a variety of conditions. And therefore, we have to be very careful in attributing this. And finally, I think that the indexes are very, very important in terms of uh, the future, I mean, uh, strategies for the management of marine uh, ecosystem. And marine spatial planning is probably nowadays uh, the uh, frontier where we have to, uh, I mean, implement uh, all our knowledge about the marine ecosystem. And uh, uh, marine spatial planning appears to be a promising tool for the management and conservation of coastal habitat, which is trying to make a step forward compared to the integrated coastal zone management that has been implemented in the last decades. And uh, to implement marine spatial planning, we nearly, really need to um, have a clear uh, mapping of marine habitats, not only from the physical point of view, but also from the ecological and biological point of view. So integrating is a GIS system, uh, geological, chemical, physical, biological, and ecological features is uh, one of the priorities. And then we will need to have indexes that have been validated and that can really summarize the ecological and biological information in a value which can be informative to the managers that need to run the systems. That's, thank you. Thank you very much for having changing the focus from atmosphere to marine ecosystem. And um, you have shown that the water resources is a very complicated ecosystem for uh, uh, develop uh, index, and really we should uh, focus, to my opinion, and to try to be consistent uh, with what the science is dictating. And I hope that uh, by 2020, when we want to reach the good status of the water, uh, resources. I hope that uh, we have made clear already this <laughs> in a short time before. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. You. We continue now with the marine ecosystems and uh, we go to the coastal areas and I will please to give the floor to Professor De Valls, uh, who is a full professor at the University of Cadiz in the Department of Physical Chemistry. He also coordinates the UNESCO Unitwin Uico Pubank, Santander's chair of the two programs of Masters and PhD Erasmus Mundus. Um, and Professor De Vaz has uh, more than 250 uh, publications um, in the field of the coastal protection and marine environment. 
and uh, he is uh, uh, responsible for more than uh, hundreds of research and educational projects, both on national and international level. He's visit he has been visiting research and professor in different institutions around the world, including the Schripps Insti Institution of Oceanography and uh, also the Universitat Federal de San Paolo, the Russia State Hydrometeorological University, and uh, also many other institutions. So, and uh, today he will show us the indicator of the index on vulnerability of coastal areas and the use of this for the risk assessment. So please, Angel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to so thanks, Maria. It has been a long time without uh, meeting together. Uh, probably you you remember me more, John. <laughs> I've been like no, you you are you are marvelous. <laughs> you are marvelous. Uh, first of all, second, I'd like to thank Luigi. I mean, it's a piacere venire tutte le anni alla Ravenna and ver tutti gli amici, gli amici that uh, I'm sorry, I cannot go further in, in Italian. <laughs> I no, no posso parlare italiano, no posso parlare italoñol, perché sería un desastre. So I will try to go in English, which is, you know, sometimes, as I, Alice say, I don't, I don't speak English. So. <laughs> yeah, uh, so but the, the, the talk today, I mean, uh, what I want is just uh, not to bore you too much about the, the index. Uh, I would like to make a statement before. Uh, now I will explain uh, some use of index for sediment quality assessment and risk management and risk assessment. However... As a scientific and a scientist and a research, I don't believe in index. I don't really believe in index. Uh, I have a chapter with Peter Chapman, uh, like seven years ago, we really were rude against uh, indexes. Uh, my friend Angel Borja sometimes got some <laughs> problems against me because I really didn't support the AMBI or the Ventis or something like that. And nice the Marco, how Marco so that they are not consistent at all. So as a scientist, I really don't trust in index. However, as supported managers, supported legislators, supported reg regulators, I'm afraid we need to make this effort to try to derive, more than derive index, is to use as, as, as good as we can, uh, if we can. So uh, I'm afraid that the society and the politician, but especially the society, they demand the scientific uh, community to provide this kind of index. If you have a spill, and you will see an example, uh, the judge will ask you directly the quick question is, how much of the spill arrive, how much of the spill can afford the ecosystem? So you need to derive this kind of an index. So I will try to show you how we did. And again, uh, it was a long time ago, and I auto criticize the index in even, start, even before they start. I really don't trust too much in what I want to show you today. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, I will use a weight of evidence approach. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, an, an integrated approach in which we use different lines of evidence. Lines of evidence to address three key questions, which are basically what contaminants, uh, what levels of contaminant, and what effect of contaminant. If we can replay this question, we will be able to assess the ecosystem health. And assessing the ecosystem health, um, the society asks us two main questions, two main index. One is the quantification of pollution, and the other is to derive, to calculate a benchmark of quality values. We did, uh, and we did, but I mean, it's quite complicated. You know, one of the key uh, things uh, is the different, um, we do have that different in Spanish. I don't know if you have in Italian, but in, in, in English, you have a difference between the terms contamination and pollution. So contamination is an increase of uh, substance, energy, something like that, anthropogenically, and pollution is with this increase of substance and energy produce effect. So we quantify this pollution using index. And based on this difference and distinguish between contamination and pollution, we calculate quality values. I mean, if we can replace a, a next, a, another question, which is by accumulation or biomagnification of contaminant, we can talk also about human health by calculating tissue quality values. Human health by, I mean, uh, by consumption of uh, contaminated species. How the, the lines of evidence are, but I mean, contamination is there to address the cause, the, the cause of the pollution. I mean, which are the responsibles of the, of, the, of the effect of the pollution? And there are, you know, hundreds and thousands of different uh, substances. I think in 1983, American Chemical Society has catalogued like one million of different xenobiotic and 
uh, industrial substance. Uh, it was in 1983, and they, they, they didn't even consider the, the intermediate of degradation. So now I don't know how many, how many substance we will have, uh, but it's an amazing number of a list of number of different contaminants. So we should be able to, to identify this contaminant. This is the first line of evidence. The second line of evidence is to uh, to be able to address the effect produced for, for the contaminant. Usually, in this in this um, um, method, in this weight of evidence approach, we pick a sediment sample and we uh, try to be uh, making uh, uh, analysis at the same time in the same space, which is quite complicated. Contamination, toxicity, uh, in situ effect, and bioaccumulation. The toxicity will inform us about the effects on the field, I mean, on the laboratory condition. We design a toxicity tests and we prove if this sediment with any of the contaminants, not only those that we measure, but all the contaminants in the matrix, uh, produce this effect. This is a list of different, I can show you some of the little ones. This is the famous amphibot. I mean, if you work with sediment, dredge it thin, and everyone would like to use the amphibot. And this is how look the, the biosay. Also, uh, the new new line of evidence used biomarkers and uh, even using biomarker the, the biomarker uh, professional they have to start to make index which again is, is quite complicated you know the essential of, of biomarkers is to measure the dynamic of the ecosystem so if you put all the variability in an index you are losing the variability but again we need the, the index and the third line of evidence is to measure the effects on the field condition you can use uh, Marco say, talk about stu studies of benthic macrobenth macrobenthic community, but you can use also um, indigenous um, uh, indigen, um, fauna like, to measure histopathology and biomarker. Also, we, we, we derive a kind of link between the, the laboratory and the field condition using caged organisms and measuring also different endpoints of toxicity, including biomarkers. This is how it looks when you go to the field and cage animals and you know, produce this kind of thing. My accumulation is basically the relation between concentration of contaminant tissue and the toxic effect. And you know, the, using this kind of bioaccumulation, you can derive tissue quality values that identify those contaminants that bioaccumulate in the in the in the tissue of the organism. If you fed this kind of animal, and you can get you know, if you have this kind of biomagnification, you can get contamination yourself, and it's quite dangerous. So, bioaccumulation is a Dangerous thing itself, but the real, the real, the real problem is when you have contaminants that suffer bio, biomagnification. So, if we conduct all all these uh, these um, studies, we will be able to derive to calculate a contamination index to uh, to answer these two first question: what contaminant, what level. We will be able to do also a toxicity index by you know compilating toxic effect under laboratory condition and also we will be able to do index in the in the in situ in situ effect and we will show, uh, we will derive a new index for uh, in situ effect uh, and you will have a list of index in the contamination toxicity under laboratory and under field condition furthermore if you want to talk about pollution you need to integrate even those index that you already so you are losing a lot of information in these steps however People, not people, but you know, managers, judge, regulators, they love, they love this kind of thing of triangles and, and index pollution. And so. uh, we use it in the 90s, and, but uh, after, after the new century, we really uh, take off out in the, in the research. However, we still use it for the academic things to, to, you know, to, to lecture how the difference between contamination and pollution is because it's so illustrative. You can see the difference in the triangles, so the difference in the area. Uh, between the reference station and the station you are studying will make you an area a quantification of the pollution and you can see uh, on, on, on your left uh, real data in which you have uh, index of pollution like 7.8, 3.2, 8.4 which you know when I started in the 90s to talk about quantifying pollution it was like wow finally we can say 3.1 of pollution which you know is still some tricky about this kind of thing. So how how we use um, I'm going so fast about how to derive to calculate index. I didn't stop, you know, to do the triangles and thin calculation. But you have the picture of we have index contamination toxicity and alteration. We can integrate and we can do pollution. How can uh, I mean uh, another another way of calculating is to use a uh, uh, factor analysis uh, using principal component analysis of extraction procedure and using that that you can also derive 
calculate, excuse me, sediment quality values. This is what they love, the, the managers. I mean, in, in, when you make this kind of environmental quality assessment, you can identify the responsibles of the pollution and then the concentration in which they are responsible to make the pollution. So it's what the you know, regulators love. We did. And uh, if you ask me how much I trust in them, I say, okay, maybe 50%, depending on the... But they are useful. And I will show how we use it in a real case. Uh, in 1998, uh, I think it's the last time the Real Madrid win one uh, championship. <laughs> 1998, we have a mini spill uh, in Spain. Uh, you know, the Tam Daily broke, and uh, they spread like seven million of uh, of uh, a cubic meter around. Uh, it was through close to the park of Doñana, which is a quite well-known park, and uh, they spread, you know, like uh, toxic material, water and toxic mat. So when you receive a call at 7 in the morning, the, the question is, can you address how much of the toxic spill arrived to the Guadalquivir estuary? How you address, can you tell us if they arrived to the Doñana Park? Things like that. No, some question, I mean, there are questions that you must to be able to answer in one week because they, they are asking by the regulator. So then you can use the index. Not in, not, I mean, if you are doing this nice research comparing or harmonizing method between Spain and Brazil or Spain, or, you should not use index. You should go to the real science. But if you m receive a call from the manager and you need to reply as soon as possible, then you need, I'm afraid, you need to go for index. But you need to go to in to, for index taking into account your, out I mean, your autocriticism. You need to be autocritical with everything. So what we did is we use uh, sediment quality, quality values. Our quality values derive in the bias credit, but also quality values used by different administrators around the world. And we select different stations around the Guadalquivir estuary, and we collect. Uh, we could do a lot of things. We can maybe go collect samples and do toxicity assessment, or but we decide just to go for sampling, measure analysis, chemical analysis. Which is was easy. I mean, in this kind of problem, you have identified the responsible. The responsible, in principle, to start it is the meaning spill, spill, sorry, and you have who are the responsible. I mean, yeah. the same three minutes. Okay, so we we will we, we know the responsible. We can go for the sampling and we can just compare the concentration you already measured in the lab, in the in the field to those concentration that you have calculated as sediment quality values. Those concentrations that, that are associated or not associated with biological effect. By doing a ratio, you can do a, an absolute ratio or maybe a relative rate, ratio, you will be able to identify <laughs> risky areas, like the red wine. And who are the responsible? In those times, it was the zinc, which was uh, mainly the problematic, uh, um, the problematic metal in the, in the meaningless field. But later, we identified the cadmium. So, remind, this is just the first approach. Index can be used as a first approach, but then you need to read the real method to identify the real pollution. Uh, I will go further because I have three minutes, and these are some of the data in which I don't believe. For instance, BC2, we identify a high level of pollution, which we don't have pollution. If you look at the triangle, you have a big triangle, but only based in the index of contamination. So it's not pollution, it's just contamination. However, your index is informing you that you have 21 of pollution. This is an error. So, as Marco said, you need to have a judgment. Or maybe you need to, derive, to calculate a more objective index or a more useful index. This is useful, but not, you, can, you, you need to take care of, of, of what you, you're telling to the, to the managers. Now, uh, just to finish, we are um, adapting all this methodology to to assess the, 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 risk, the risk assessment for this new technology, which is carbon capture and estuarate. We will take the CO2 and we will put back in the, in the coal and, and the field uh, holes. And uh, well, in, in the seabed is now development a lot of, a lot of uh, research. Um, basically, we use the same. We change the lines of evidence, taking into account the variability in pH, the main the main problem when you have leaks of CO2 in the ocean is the acidification, uh, a part of all the problems, but mainly acidification, how, how it affects to these different lines of evidence. We, um, we have detected how the bioaccumulation 
uh, significantly increase when you in increase one pH, uh, one unit of pH. Usually, the, glo the global warming, the global chain does not change one unit of pH, but if you have a leak in the carbon capture storage, you will have a decrease low, I mean higher than one unit of pH, and that produces really, really the differences in the in the toxicology and in the contamination and especially the risk. I'm finished. Thank you. I hope. I Thank you, Angel. I think that your presentation will pose a lot of questions later. And um, since uh, it's very provocative, uh, I would <laughs> confess the use of indicators. But as uh, as um, administrator or 50-50, I must uh, confess that we need indicators. And uh, sometimes they're very useful, but they need the sound indicators. Okay. And uh, so we really need the help of the scientists like you and the scientific communities to develop the best indicator as much as possible in the context of the constraints that we recognize. But to work on indicator is very useful and can give very, very straightforward information to, ta to the decision makers uh, to take decision. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Pleasure. The... Um, section now uh, with uh, uh, Filomena Cardoso and Filomena uh, I have two different names I have Filomena Cardoso Filomena Martins ah okay okay <laughs> sorry for this um, she's a geographer uh, with a PhD in science applied to the environment in the University of Aviero I think it's Portugal no? Um, Filomena is responsible of the Sea Science and Coastal Zone Master Course, teaches a set of courses in the field of the environment, territorial planning, natural resources, sea science and coastal management. And she develops research in the field of integrated coastal zone planning. Uh, natural and cultural heritage conservation, participation and citizen, social risk perception and man management. She is the uh, author of more than 100 publications, book, reports and chapters in the, in the field uh, of research that we have mentioned. And today she will discuss with us how to measure the progress in education on sustainability. So Filomena, the floor is yours. Thank you very much um, for your uh, words, and uh, I, I, I start with uh, thank also uh, Luigi Bruzzi to uh, renew this invitation to, to be here at Ravenna, um, and I will try to follow the, the theme that uh, was uh, suggests me, uh, suggests me to, to talk about uh, in these three years about education and uh, some challenges in education. Okay, I, I'm not going to um, uh, tell you exactly how to measure the progress in education on sustainability. Uh, if I have this uh, answer to give you, this, uh, this, um, this is uh, the, the, full, uh, the million dollar answer that I will have it. And uh, you know that there are m much more challenges than answers in this, in this process. Um, so uh, I'll go to uh, these uh, f five points very, very briefly. Um, and um, just to point out, uh, I don't... Okay. Um, I just want to, uh, to, to go to the concept, even uh, not trying to, to tell uh, again the, the same story, but to, to uh, point out how uh, complex and how demanding is the uh, sustainable development concept and um, how uh, it um, uh, make us uh, work in um, very well uh, and very, very strong demanding uh, fields in the economic fields and the environmental fields and the, in the social fields. Each one of these uh, fields are already uh, for themselves very demanding in terms of the, produc the production of indicators. But when we try to 
fulfill the, 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 um, the concept and the implementation of the concept as a, um, a paradigm of, of, of the society uh, and we try to reconnect these three fields, the complexity hires much, much more. So uh, this involves also the need for uh, education in economic field, the need for education in environmental field, the need for education in social fields, and how they are interconnected and how they uh, feed up uh, each other. So, um, because of this complexity, uh, and we are putting so many effort uh, either human resources, either uh, financial resources, indicators are needed to make those linkage uh, visible, uh, to make the trade-off between them visible also, and uh, to, as already uh, Maria Betty uh, said, to evaluate uh, long, if the long-term decisions and short-term decisions that we are uh, doing in, the, in, the, in this implementation process are uh, in the right way and uh, how we are uh, developing in terms of progress. So, um, how education fits in this uh, need for um, monitoring the process, the progress in sustainable development. So if we need to uh, change uh, social behaviors, social uh, attitudes, we, change, we need to change in terms of economic, uh, economic um, way to, to, to do business and environmental uh, values and, and, uh, and um, behaviors. Of course, education is the um, master uh, tool, we can say. And uh, um, when I uh, uh, refer education, education as an all, uh, also education training, uh, education a long life is what uh, uh, we uh, are talking about. So, education uh, for um, sustainable development um, is as uh, uh, the UNESCO uh, organization um, uh, refer in the in the launch of the decade for uh, environmental for sustainable development. It's not an option; it's a, a priority. In order to have um, sustainable uh, progress in terms of environmental areas and other uh, uh, in other fields, we need to. Uh, address these issues through uh, the e education. So um, we have these challenges uh, in terms of the decade. We are try in finishing this decade. 2004 uh, is the deadline. Uh, we have already uh, reports along the uh, along the process since 2005. I'm sorry, until now uh, they, are, they are being um, produced several reports and uh, one common uh, thing in do all those reports is the delay in the, uh, uh, the achievement of the, uh, uh, the outputs uh, uh, that are set up in the beginning. So uh, this delay uh, it's uh, somehow uh, an indicator that the, the task is uh, quite difficult, quite complex and uh, quite demanding in terms of organization uh, policies and things like that. So the challenges are uh, already um, um, presented here, faces, facing the complexity of sustainable development concept, I already said, increase the awareness about it. Uh, we can say uh, by the uh, indicators that we have uh, available that um, we are still uh, in great part of the world in this first step of the process of uh, education for sustainable development in the increasing of awareness, even if we have different um, uh, different speeds uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the in the process. Um, we need uh, to engage the traditional um, uh, curriculum uh, to uh, what who is normally very um, uh, sectorial, very fragmented in a, a trans transdisciplinary framework. So, take the 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 environment the the. Um, Education for Sustainable Development as a, a, a transversal um, uh, issue, 
sharing the responsibility and this is somehow shifting uh, and um, and uh, dealing with uh, the, the, the responsib responsibility for education has a formal responsibility for the government, but also the responsibility for the uh, civil society, the associations, uh, the, the um, uh, cooperative associations. So um, sharing that responsibility in education uh, demanding, demands also not only uh, the traditional way to look uh, about sustainable development and we we are not uh, uh, speaking about education about sustainable development we are uh, talking about education for sustainable development is a great difference in this process uh, we are trying to educate for changing uh, behaviors, give skills to the people uh, and embrace and make the people embrace this new idea of living in their own communities. So um, this is not uh, so um, uh, uh, as you, um, the education as usual when we do some renewing of the curriculum, just put some uh, key words and key concepts in the process and everything is done. Without that, we cannot achieve sustainable development, of course. Uh, and then the involving community in the process, it's quite important and uh, several um, comparative studies in, um, in the progress uh, on um, education for sustainable development in the most traditional formal education with uh, uh, very well-established curriculum in each discipline. And uh, um, uh, other uh, other kind or uh, other other type of, of uh, uh, programs uh, educational programs that are more uh, tailored to the needs of communities um, show that we have short um, uh, results uh, short time results much more uh, um, strong and much more intense in this new way to uh, do uh, the education than in the most, most traditional, more formal, most uh, structured uh, education programs. And of course, building human capaci capacity, uh, that means that uh, we need to uh, not only uh, look to the, those who are um, uh, focused in the uh, educational process, in the educational programs, but uh, all those who are uh, in the in the in the in the uh, living, all the all the all the, those ones who are uh, doing their own job and try to. Um, contaminate the, the way they do their job with this new uh, idea of maintain the resources, use the resources to be happy, of course, right now, but to let them uh, be also re resources in the, uh, in the future time. And this, this of course, uh, um, needed uh, the, the public policies development. Um, and uh, Public policies development, uh, we can see it in two different, two, two different ways. We can see public policy development in paper, and we can see public policy development in field. And uh, almost, we, if we go for different uh, um, regions in the world, uh, different countries, more or less we can see that public policy development in terms of uh, education for sustainable development are uh, set up in paper. I at least mention in the in the government uh, guidelines. However, when we go deep and try to see how it's implemented, uh, well, there the diversity is very high in the process. And of course, nothing can be done without financial support and material uh, resources. So um, we need also, uh, when we, for instance, uh, set up an uh, awareness campaign, uh, well, very, uh, we need to, 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 to think about how we are spending the money. We are not just making a festival. This festival has a purpose and that purpose uh, needs to be, in the end, um, efficient in terms of, the, of the, the results that we get from that festival. Of course, we cannot say that uh, 
uh, uh, cause effect, immediately cause effect, uh, the, in, the impact of those um, um, suicide, uh, um, continuous festival probably can be uh, seen in 10, 20 years. So we need to... Um, to be uh, very careful in the in the in the way we spend our money. You have two minutes. Okay. So uh, the um, uh, looking to to this, the, the United Nations uh, um, Environmental Commission, uh, Economic uh, Economic Commission for the, the uh, for Europe and Canada set up a strategy. And uh, they uh, developed uh, those uh, strategy uh, focus on these six objectives. Uh, each one of we have here um, organigram, not uh, not not a conceptual model. This is an organigram how things uh, are uh, um, uh, set up in the strategy and how uh, the indicators are used also. Uh, with connection with the, the uh, um, dissemination of good practices and quality descriptors to um, to the to the self assessment of the implementation of this strategy for each objective um, they uh, defined uh, several um, indicators each as uh, you can you can see uh, in this list there are uh, only few comparing for instance with the um, uh, the system of indicators of environment uh, from the, the the European Union or the OECD uh, European um, environmental indicator system who are very uh, um, very uh, larger but in each one of these uh, uh, indicators, there are a, a, a set of sub-indicators, and uh, the great part of those indicators are checklist indicators, uh, mainly checklist indicators of something uh, to, uh, uh, to set up a, a reference um, a moment, and how this, from this reference moment, policies are changing out. Uh, they are, all of them, qualitative indicators. Until now, uh, well, we can see examples from the UK, from Canada, who have uh, deeply uh, uh, in, uh, been engaged in the development of these indicators. They still don't uh, can do a uh, um, quantitative indicator to simplify uh, these, these complexity. So, all of them are qualitative indicators. And uh, just to, um, as example of the uh, three uh, sub-indicators for the first objective, they set up the guidelines, and even when we think these guidelines could help uh, each country to develop those own indicators, for instance, when we go to the first one, um, and I don't uh, expect you to read the the the, the, the small uh, the small characters, uh, but just to tell you, there's things like go to the reports of government ministries, interested government ministries. What, can we define? who are the ministry who are involved in the process. Well, in a broad way, you can say all the ministries, because all public policies are uh, some, some way involved in the, in the process of education. One minute. Yeah, and one minute yeah. for the final. So, okay, um, there's a lot to be done uh, still in order to quantify or to make more accountability the process of uh, uh, measure the progress in education for sustainability. Because uh, sustainable development is a complex and evolving concept, is a challenge concept, and we, uh, when we uh, react to a reference moment, we are already dealing to a, se a step for, forward. Uh, then the um, 
it's also difficult because uh, the, the environmental sustainable um, development, uh, I'm sorry, the education for sustainable development uh, deals with all values at all levels of the education. And uh, uh, for instance, uh, how uh, are the priority uh, in each country? Just an example, UK uh, start for, um, for Wales to deal first with higher education institutions. F it was their, set their, the, their priority focus on higher education institu institutions. Scotland um, start with schools, primary schools. So in the same country, uh, even if they have their autonomic uh, um, governments, they uh, pr give priority to the to the educa formal education. They give priority to different levels. So they uh, adjust the the guidelines to their own uh, local or regional um, uh, features. Uh, this, this expert group uh, has been uh, developing lots of uh, uh, reports in the, uh, um, in the critical an analysis of the indicators that they set up. Uh, but in the end, uh, until now, what they uh, figure out is that that's not possible until now, and as far as they uh, get in the, in the, in the, in the analysis, um, probably uh, for a long time, at least at the regional, national level, at local level, there's another uh, thing. Uh, it's not possible to uh, find direct indicators to measure uh, education for sustainable development. Those measurements will be made by uh, inferred or uh, indirect indicators for policy, program and practices uh, and for personal and social indicators. But even if we try to do is indirectly, well, uh, it would be another story if we go deep for, for instance, the indicators for social um, social indicators for sustainable development and this will take too much time. Thank you for yeah. your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philomena, for having put out to our attention the importance of indicators for the sustainable development eradication of poverty that is based on education also. And now I would like to give the floor to Alice Newton. Alice is a chemical oceanographer and she has more than 20 years experience in coordinating several international and national research programs across a number of different scientists uh, and disciplines. And she's the chairperson of the land ocean interaction in the coastal zone, a core project of the international biosphere geosphere program and the international human dimension program. Uh, Alice is uh, um, author of uh, several publications, more than uh, 50 publications in the in the field, and uh, she. Okay, I'll give you the floor, Alice. She will speak about the indicators and this is of water quality and availability. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here in Ravenna again, and uh, it's a reminder, an annual reminder, that Italians benefit from living in culture and art, because really Ravenna is an excellent example of how beautiful your cultural heritage and also your country is. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, and I've been listening with great interest this morning, and I hope that some of the things I will be telling you will be uh, also contributing and thinking about what the other speakers have uh, mentioned. Uh, thank you especially to my colleague Luigi for uh, inviting me uh, kindly to join you here in Ravenna. So I'm going to be talking about indices for water quality and uh, I've been asked to address uh, three topics. First of all, availability. Secondly, quality, and how do we assess 
uh, water quality and uh, availability. So I think many of you know this uh, photograph. I, I particularly love this angle of our planet because it really shows that it shouldn't be called Earth, it should be called water. And uh, even the white on the picture, of course, is water. It might be ice and it might be water vapor. But, uh, so we have, we're living in a very, very uh, aquatic environment. But although it's a very aquatic environment, less than 1% of that is usable fresh water. And that's what we mainly depend on. So I'm an oceanographer, so I study this. But in fact, what we can use is really very, very little of uh, what's available even as fresh water because so much of the fresh water is locked up in glaciers. So we have a very uneven distribution of water resources. And what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to think of the Earth system. So it's a global approach. Um, but I'm also going to focus on, on Europe because that's where we live. And that's um, the focus of a lot of our policies that have been mentioned this morning. So as you can see, a lot of our water is locked up in the Antarctic ice cap. That's not very useful for us. Actually, only quite a quite small proportion of the water is available in the large lakes and the reservoirs and, and the rivers. Most of the water that we use is actually in groundwater. So I'm using these figures because these are figures that have been developed by UNEP and they're all based on indices. They're indices, different ways of looking at water availability and water quantity. One of the things that I find quite interesting is this idea about transboundary issues because, of course, our political map cuts up our countries and our regions, for instance, Scotland and England, as the previous speaker mentioned. Um, but actually, uh, the boundaries are not the same for the water. Uh, we share our catchments and we share many of our uh, water resources. And so how we, are, how we ha are to share that in an equitable manner is an important question. And it's one, for instance, that the European Union has tried to address by ignoring these uh, divisions and looking at river basins, looking at catchments as, of the water resource. I'd like to draw your attention to uh, this figure. I lived for 30 years in Portugal. And you see, Portugal actually has quite a lot more rain than Spain. But if you see it on this index, you can see that it's more vulnerable than Spain. Why? Because the percentage of total renewable water resource originates outside the country. So most of the big rivers of Portugal originate in Spain. So if we don't have a catchment uh, approach to these things, we can have these transboundary issues and these problems that can arise between neighboring countries. Another way of looking at water availability, another index, uh, here is the cubic meters per person per year. And if you see, for instance, here, you wouldn't expect this area of Europe to have less water availability and to be closer to water scarcity. But they are. It's because the way they consume water and the population. So you will see that uh, countries in southern Europe, where you would expect where there's less rainfall, the more arid, you would expect them to uh, have less water availability and, and more scarcity. But in fact, it's these countries here in uh, relatively northern Europe. I now live in Norway. That's really north. If you look at the over-exploitation of water resources, so this is a water stress indicator. This is one of the indicators that we're talking about in this conference. Uh, you can see, again, a different picture. So, yes, of course, we would expect uh, these areas of North Africa near the Sahara Desert to be extremely, uh, have a water stress indicator that's extremely high. But also, many areas of the Iberian Peninsula 
If you look at, at Italy, where we are now, you can see this north-south divide in Italy. So these indicators can be quite useful. Um, and you can see in the UK, Scotland, no problem. But England, yes, there is a problem. Maybe that's why the English drink Scottish water with their whiskey. So I'm not going to be talking about pollution and contamination because Angel gave a very good talk on that, so I don't need. Um, I am going, however, to talk about Water Framework Directive and the Marine Strategy Framework Directive that Marco also mentioned this morning. This is the problem of being the speaker at the end of the morning, that everybody else has said everything. So, um, um, However, I'm hoping to mention some of the things that Marco said, but also to uh, add some, some aspects. Marco is uh, fundamentally a great ecologist, so probably what he has to say is um, uh, most important. Um, I want to talk about the different way that uh, the assessment of ecological status is made in the Water Framework Directive and the environmental status is made in the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. These two directives are complementary to each other in the marine space because the ecological status of the Water Framework Directive includes the coastal zone, the coastal waters, but the environmental status of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive has a different focus. It has a regional focus. It focuses on the regional seas. And so it's very important also for us at the European level to be walking with, working with the regional sea conventions. So in the Water Framework Directive, we have uh, an ecological status that can be high. That is our reference condition, what we want to get back to or good, or moderate, or important, or uh, bad. So these are the differences from the reference condition, and this is the ecological status. The thing that's interesting uh, is that it's almost monodimensional, isn't it? It's like all, all, the, all the chemists will feel very comfortable with this, because it's like those little uh, strips that we dip in some of our solutions. Um, to give an indication of pH, for instance, which is actually just an indicator of acidity. The uh, Marine Strategy Framework Directive is different. It just looks at good or not good. But that seems to be a, a very black and white picture. In fact, underneath the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, there's a lot more, and I'll ex try to explain that in the next few minutes. What we really want to do is to prevent degradation, identify where there's problems, and then restore. So, just to summarize, good ecological status is for the Water Framework Directive. Good environmental status is for the Marine Strategy Framework Directive and the Regional Sea Conventions. So, what's the fundamental difference? Well, I like to think of it as uh, being a difference between structural and functional. So in the case of the Water Framework Directive, it's one out, all out, and um, if the assessment is bad for one of the elements, uh, then we consider everything to be bad. But in the case of uh, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, we have used what we call an ecosystem-based approach. And this, to me, is a very interesting way of looking at uh, our environmental problems and uh, sustainability, because it considers the human, human activities and the human beings as part of the ecosystem. So it's a functional approach. Uh, some of our activities and some of the problems that derive from some of our activities are included. For instance, litter, eutrophication, uh, fishing, pressure on commercial species. So how do we monitor these? What do we do in order to get to these indicators? Well, we use a whole load of environmental variables, such as pH, such as temperature. It's a little bit like going to the doctor when they take your temperature, they take your blood pressure, and then they try to... If the indicator is good, they can tell that there's something really seriously wrong with you. But they're just guidelines. 
Um, and we also look at the biological variables. That's a little bit more complicated, as Marco explained this morning. So with the physico-chemical uh, elements in the Water Framework Directive, we look at the water, and, but we also look at some of the components of the ecosystem. But with the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, we're looking at a whole load of different things, some of them linked to human activities. So one is structural and the other one is functional. So now I've been asked to talk about indicators of the status of the environment and the status of the ecosystem. And like Angel and Marco, I'm a little bit critical of these things. I've actually also published a paper where I compared for the same data set, actually it was my data, in, in the same system, I used different indicators and found quite different answers. So, yes, indicators are, um, they're not the whole story, and as researchers, um, uh, as researchers we, we, we question them, but they're also quite, quite important. So when you take your child to the doctor and the temperature is 39, you know that there's a problem. Uh, it's a very simple indicator, but it's an indicator of health. One of the ones I've been looking at recently is Rockstrom's, what I call Ross, Rockstrom's rosette. This paper was published in Nature in um, uh, 2009, and uh, I found it a very intriguing paper because he looked at the planetary boundaries. Where are we exceeding the planetary boundaries? And some of them are to do, for instance, with chemical pollution, which Angel addressed, and some of them are to do with global freshwater use, which I uh, mentioned. Uh, in, the, in this talk, but also there's things like eutrophication, which is my field of interest, the nitrogen cycle, and the phosphorus cycle. So I find this a very interesting way of using a, like a compound uh, indicator. It's a little bit like Angel's triad, but even more extensive. So that's what we're trying to do. If you remember, for the Water Framework Directive, we were... Uh, using uh, this little strip, and now we're trying to use for the Marine Strategy Framework Directive something derived from um, the, the Rockstrom's Rosette. And uh, we're doing this in uh, a big European project, actually coordinated by Angel Borja, who's AMBI um, um, uh, indicator, has been commented about uh, two of the speakers this morning. So, what do we want? Effective indicators, what do we mean? Uh, indicators of water quality and quantity. Um, often, as uh, someone who can do water analyses, um, I'm asked, uh, would you analyze the water for my cistern or for my well? And I say, well, yes, I will do that and I can do it, but what do you want to use the water for? because a different set of analyses need to be made if you're going to drink the water or if you're just going to water your vegetables. So what do we want? Do we want to drink it? Do we want to bathe in it? Is it to grow shellfish in? All these different types of water, different uses, we need to monitor them in different ways and um, we need to apply different indicators. Uh, one of the things that we do that's very strange in our society is that we flush the toilet with the same quality of water as we brush our teeth with. That is a very, very strange behavior. Um, and um, one that, of course, affects uh, the water quantity and availability uh, and actually does not improve the water quality. We need our indicators also to be cost-effective, especially when we're thinking about the whole regional seas of, uh, of the European Union. Yeah, Thank you. I will finish. Um, and they need to be sensitive. They need to be actually answering the question. Um, so taking the temperature of somebody might not be a good indication of the fact that they've got a broken leg unless that leg is, uh, is actually infected. Um, they need to be cost effective, they need to be sensitive, but we also need to be innovative. We have a tremendous capacity, human beings, to be innovative. 
And this is where education is so important. We need to come up with new ways of uh, assessing and monitoring our environment. We need to be able to look at the trends. Uh, several of the speakers spoke about the trends. Um, I find this one interesting. It's the difference between the extraction and the consumption of water and the potential that's locked up to recycle so much of our water. Why can't we flush our toilet with the water that we took our shower with? It's only a question of infrastructure and plumbing. Um, so what you mentioned about green cities as well is, is very relevant to that. Um, one of the things that we've done uh, quite effectively in the European Union, and I'm pleased that UNEP has given the European Union this prize, um, is we've been looking very carefully at adaptive management frameworks. We've been looking at, for instance, the, the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive has actually been a great success because we've managed and we can see by measuring the trend of uh, phosphate in the water of rivers in Europe and in lakes that is coming down. So our efforts are paying off. I've been working with the OSPAR Commission on the atmospheric deposition of lead and we can see now that actually cutting the lead out of the gasoline is we can actually see it now in the indicators that we're using for atmospheric deposition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alice, for this uh, presentation on uh, the two main directives on water that we have now in the Union ongoing, related also to the waste directive, and uh, also for having mentioned the fact that we have to consider the uh, water resources as a basin, and uh, it came to my uh, mind uh, the work that we are doing on the Danube strategy that the NUB is one of the base in the catchment, one of the most important. Yes, <laughs> and this is uh, huge. And of course, uh, water is a part of diplomacy because the water is creating conflict. And uh, fortunately, not really in Europe, but if we go in developing countries in Africa, water is one of the main causes of conflict. So there is a lot of diplomacy in the water issues. But I think we'll discuss later about this. And now I would like to give the floor to the next speaker, who is uh, Johanna von Toggenburg, is a consultant in energy and the environment. But, uh, this is a projection of the video. Ah, it's a projection of the video. And so we do this proje projection now, or we, we no. give the floor to the next? To the next yes. two speakers, we are yes. Daniel Marasco and Tila Carson. And they will present Thank the... You. Environmental behavior of green uh, of green roof in the city of New York. The performance of full scale green roof network from a storm water management perspective. And the two speakers are candidates for PhD at the Columbia University in the New York City. So I'm very uh, I would like to to ask the speaker to to give the presentation. Not before we project it. Ah, okay. Maybe. Before we project, and then we give the yes. presentation. So okay. So then, then we close. Then we close the okay. morning session. Okay. For Good. the afternoon session. Ah, I have some. For the afternoon session, uh, we will start at 2.20 with the projection of a film from the University of Granada. And Mrs. Alice Newton will chair the section of this afternoon. And I thank you very much for taking this, because I have to leave. Thank you very much.
So actually I was correct. I will invite the two Americans to present their research. You can find and congratulations for being candidates for this PhD Thank you. at the Columbia. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, my name is Tyler Carson, and uh, this is Dan Morasco. And before we started, we just wanted to sincerely thank all the organizers and panel members for having us for having us here, uh, having the opportunity to speak among, uh, alongside um, such distinguished professors is very exciting for both of us, and we're very grateful for that. Um, okay, so a, a lot of the themes I think we heard this morning was the need to monitor and assess our environment to help uh, create some, some sustainable solutions, and this is one of those projects that we're working on in, in New York City. And so this project came about with a National Science Foundation grant to three of our mentors. Um, Dr. Culligan at the top is our PhD advisor, and Wade McGillis and Stuart Gaffin are also professors at um, Columbia. Today we're going to talk about um, green infrastructure in New York and some of the broad indicators that we're trying to use to figure out how they're performing at the city scale. And so we can better assess what our implementations options are and uh, which systems will be most effective. So just to give a little background, green roofs are an, uh, an engineered um, vegetated rooftop. You put soil up on top of there with some plants and let it grow basically. Um, and the idea here is in New York City, as little as three millimeters an hour of rainfall can trigger combined sewer overflows. This is when you have too much water in your sewer system and it washes into your nearby waterways, as little as three millimeters an hour. It's a significant issue in New York. All of these dots are the locations of these combined sewer overflows. So you can see it's citywide problem, all the water bodies, and uh, resulting in about 75 billion liters um, a year of pollution. So this is a pretty hot topic in New York. They're about to spend 1.5 billion in the next 15 years to uh, to implement green infrastructure, and so we're kind of hoping to make these green roofs as efficient as possible for when they, when they do construct them. Uh, just really brief background, uh, there's two types of green roofs. Intensive are your deeper ones, extensive are thinner ones. They're more common because the more roof types can handle them. Uh, so in New York City, we have a green roof monitoring network. It's seven roofs throughout all the city. Uh, just to orient you right there, that big patch of green in the middle is Central Park. So we have roofs in all five boroughs that are fully instrumented to collect uh, environmental data as well as stormwater runoff, which will be the topic of, of, of this talk today. So the three roofs that we wanted to talk about of the seven we have, uh, they make up all three of the major green roof construction types. So you have one construction type that's a basically a carpet that you lay out called the pre-vegetated mat, mat over the roof. It's very thin. Ours on this roof is 32 millimeters thick of substrate. Very, very thin that plants can live on. There's a modular tray system, which are just big plastic trays that you fill up with soil and place them right on the roof. And then the final one is uh, built in place where it's just built layered on the roof site. You'll have a drainage layer, a substrate layer and vegetation on top of that that's all done in place. So these are the three roofs we're going to talk about today, some of our um, monitoring data and some of the indicators that we're trying to use to figure out how effective they're going to be to help stop this combined sewer overflow problem. 
This is the uh, equipment we're using, a typical weather station on each roof. And then the sensors to the right are custom designed by our group. Um, basically, it's an ultrasonic sensor that sits in a weir flume, a vertical flume. And the sensor gives us the depth behind the flume so we know the runoff at any, at any point remotely. This is what that looks like in plan. Uh, so these just fit right into the downspouts of buildings um, right on the rooftop. So we have continuous data, five minute, every five minutes, all these environmental uh, re recordings and then the runoff for about two, two and a half years now. And so um, Dan's going to talk a little bit about some of the indicators we found and what the performance might be at the roof and, and the city scale. So one of the things that we notice is in a lot, there's a lot of green roof literature that discusses the runoff volume. However, all of these roofs are monitored using different methods and in different climates. So we, as mentioned, went on to monitor these roofs in New York City. We separated our events based on six hours of no rainfall or runoff, a dry period. And what we did when we were looking at the data, we noticed that the event runoff percentage increased with storm size. So you're getting less retention as the storm increased. And however, the issue was that we were having different storms on different roofs and it led to irregularities in the data. This is a comparison of our three roofs that we studied here. And you can see that the performance varies. There's not a very linear trend from point to point. And that has a lot to do with the difference in the storm distributions. So as you can see that looking at the rainfall on each of the three roofs, as well as a historic rainfall period from 40 years in New York, you have different distributions of different storm sizes. We have, on two of our roofs, we have a lot more storms in the 50 plus category here, millimeters, that's the depth during the event, compared to here, which is the average over the historic period. And in these roofs, we also have a bit lower in terms of small storms, which would lead to higher overall retention due to more chance to recharge. And uh, less of the storage capacity being used. So just a little bit of a talk about the climate that we have in New York. It's very similar to the climate here. In terms of general rainfall, we have 1.2 meters of rainfall per year on average, about 95 events, and 69 of these events are above that threshold and thus cause CSOs. So what we were do doing to normalize the distribution, we created a, what we define as a characteristic runoff equation. This relates the runoff to the rainfall on a total event volume basis. So you can see that for each one of our roofs, we have one of these curves, and they correlate well to the data points that we collected. And so what this allowed us to do was apply the data to 40 years of historic rainfall and thus normalize the function of the roofs. And you can see here that by normalizing, it makes the trends a lot smoother and shows the relationship between the different types of roofs. As you, can, as you saw, in the, I'm going to go back to this previous graph. As you can see here, this red bar, the Con Ed rooftop, which was the modular tray system, had the best overall performance. However, it had the weakest performance in the 10 millimeter mark, while the other roofs followed a very similar trend to each other. USPS, which we talked about as the built in place system, was the strongest performer overall, uh, strongest performer in the small storms, and would be very good if you were trying to limit the amount of small events that were causing runoff and thus minimize the number of CSO event events as opposed to Con Ed, which would be better for total volume. West 118th, which was the pre-vegetated mat, showed the worst performance overall. However, because it's significantly lighter than the other roofs, it's very good for retrofit and easy to just put on older buildings. So in New York, about 60% of the CSO events are for those small storms, 0 to 10 millimeters. However, 60% of the CSO volume occurs in storms over 40 millimeters. So your design principles really dictate which roof is better for this. And your best green roofs depends on your conditions and stormwater management goals. So 
what we're seeing here is that normally when you, when you indicate green roof performance, you just give it a straight number that you apply for reducing the runoff or generating a curve number. But what we saw was an interaction of different roof types. And this, the configuration of the roof and the properties of the, not just the substrate, influence the performance. And generating the CREs allows you to compare different rooftops both in one region or a different region against each other by standardizing the rainfall. And you could also predict the performance in different climates using the CREs for rooftops in other climates. And how we're planning to forward this? We recently installed a monitoring system at the University of Bologna to allow us to compare our data to theirs and further the knowledge of the green roof performance. And they had this roof installed just recently and we hope this will reveal a lot more about green roof performance and help us make better decisions about uh, stormwater infrastructure. And I think that's it. So thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for these wonderful presentations. I remember that in the Green Week we had in 2012, there was also an action in Europe on the green roof, and that was in Brussels, this architecture of green roofs, mm -hmm. they started this. Uh, I have a question. Um, in terms of cost, uh, have you calculated the revenue in benefit uh, if you have a storm and you have this roof, how much gain in order if in the case that you have? I think one of the really difficult challenges that we have along with most others is monetizing environmental benefits is very, very challenging. You could say that you're taking volume away from the sewer systems, but how do you put a price on uh, pounds of lead in the Hudson or, you know, less volume CSO. It's, it's, it's very tricky. We've looked at the prices of the green roofs to figure out among the construction types which ones um, are most cost effective. But uh, sim no one really wants to give the price of their green roofs either. So it's a little, it's a, it's a bit tricky uh, working around this. But you can uh, value the price of the green infrastructure, maybe, as the green infrastructure as a price in the context of the, the entire city, for instance. Yeah. I think the one difficulty there is that the second step to understanding the benefit is knowing the sewer system um, configuration. So we should need to tie that in, and then that's how you can figure out what, mm -hmm. how they relate to everything else. Thank you very much. There are some other questions from the audience uh, to this interesting uh, young initiative uh, showing the creativity and what we need for innovation and growth in Europe and in the world. Yes, Alice, please. For a year. Is that uh, distributed throughout the year? So you, you would never need to water this green roof? A lot of the specifications for New York is you have irrigation for the first two years and then and then nothing after that. It's pretty even throughout the seasons if you if you look at it. Yeah, there's a slight peak in the summer and the coldness usually in the winter they grow back. They kind of lose a bit of mass, but they come back every year. The sedum plants. Uh, Luigi, you are... ah, okay. So thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, so I announce now the video that is based on innovation, uh, good practice to reduce water consumption.
Let's first have a look at the distribution of the Earth's water. Out of all the water available on the planet, about Today I would like to speak about good practices to reduce water consumption. Let's first have a look at the distribution of the Earth's water. Out of all the water available on the planet, about 96.5% is oceans, and only about 2.5% is fresh water. Out of this fresh water, about 68.6% .6 is trapped in glaciers and ice caps, so only about 30% is actually accessible to one some way. The amount of water in the world hydrological cycle stays always the same. The natural process of precipitation, runoff, infiltration, evaporation ensures that the water moves in our atmosphere. However, the overall water balance does not change. However, we have an increase in climate change, extreme weather events, changing precipitation patterns and that means that some areas will be more affected by droughts and others by flooding than previously. The distribution and availability of water on the planet is unequally distributed. There is also an increased demand for fresh water for human consumption, for personal, agricultural and industrial uses. This is due to an increase of the world's population. The world's population is growing by about 80 million people a year, implying an increased freshwater demand of about 64 billion cubic meters. The increased demand for water is also due to improved hygiene standards, increased energy use, water-intensive technologies, etc. Water use has been growing at more than twice the rate of population increase in the last century, according to the Food and Agricultural Organization. This leads to over-abstraction, and consequences of this are, for example, salt water intrusion into aquifers in coastal areas. But it also leads to pollution and thus less fresh water being available for our consumption or being unfit for human consumption. So let's look at the water use currently. The UN suggests that 20 to 50 liters of water per person per day for drinking, cooking and cleaning is necessary. However, in some countries such as United States, Italy, France, even Israel, um, located in a already water-stressed region, use much more than that. The largest water use for agriculture um, is for agricultural irrigation, about 70%, and also its projected increase is the strongest. On the graph on your right, uh, below, you see not only the increase of agricultural, industrial and domestic water use, but you also, also see the withdrawal and the consumption. And you can recognize that there is a gap between those two, which is highlighted sort of a darker color. This indicates that there is a very high water loss. So let's look at methods to help ensure water availability. 
There is water saving, such as reducing water consumption and pollution, maintenance um, or technical measures to reduce water losses in distribution networks, rainwater harvesting, etc. There are end-of-pipe technologies, so water reuse and wastewater reuse. And finally, there are some management and economic drivers that can increase water efficiency, such as adopting a river basin approach and attaching the right value to water. Reducing water use and water demand management um, is the simplest way to save water. And this can be done nowadays without even foregoing luxury. Practical tips include, look at your water bill first of all, try to identify where and when you're using most water, install a meter, and looking at your water meter regularly will help you also identify possible leaks in your water network. All this will have, help you save costs also. Of course, you can apply very simple devices such as water saving toilet flushes or water saving taps and faucets. Another method would be, for example, to put a bucket or bowl under the tap when you're, for example, letting the water run, waiting for cold water to drink. Also important in terms of evaporation of water is to water your garden in the morning or in the evening, not throughout the day. Reducing water pollution at source is very important because once these emerging pollutants or harmful pollutants get into the water, it's very difficult to filter them out or eliminate them. Practical tips include not washing your oils, solvents, paints or pharmaceuticals down the drain, but instead storing them in a safe container and taking them to an authorized collection center. You can also use the credited biodegradable detergents, uh, which are nowadays just as good and efficient as other detergents. There is an EU-funded project called Pharmas, which assesses the risks and raises social awareness about the effects of pharmaceuticals on water. They've produced a really nice uh, video animation which I recommend um, you watch when you have a moment of time. Reducing water losses and distribution networks is actually a high priority at EU level nowadays um, because it's been recognized that in some mem European member states up to 50% of water abstracted is lost through the leakages. So reducing water losses is technically possible. Many methods and, and technologies exist for this already. However, the cost and benefit from investing into this are not measured and not clear to you know, administrations, society, and the companies themselves. So however practical tips would include setting up leakage monitoring and detection systems, which can be done both by you at a household level or at a larger level, municipal and administrative. And at national level, it's important to introduce regulatory and customer metering policies. Looking at rainwater harvesting for non-potable... Grey water reuse means... Thank you, and if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Okay, I was instructed to do like so, so I did. Uh, I would like to conclude these sections uh, thanking all the speakers of today for the really motivating, provocating and interesting presentations that I hope that will stimulate some discussions during the afternoon and uh, I will pass the chair to Alice. She will chair the afternoon sections and then uh, we'll do some conclusions. With you. Thank you very much, and thank you very much to the organizer and uh, to Madame Roncuzzi, who was very pleased to stay with us the entire morning. Thank you very much.